Hello and welcome to this very special edition of How to Be a Great GM. My name is Guy and I'll be hosting the Ghosts of Salt Marsh live RPG playthrough on the D&D channel on Twitch this coming May, May 25th. Watch out for that. And what we're going to be doing, as we have done with all of our campaigns in the past, is that I shall be taking you through what I think the campaign for the Ghosts of Salt Marsh should be. Now, there are some spoilers that you must be made aware of. These spoilers uh, are that if you are watching this show, I'm going to be talking about how I plan to run these adventures, what adventures I'm planning on running, what monsters I'm planning on giving them, how I'm going to give them those monsters, how I'm going to make maps for this particular series of adventures, all those kinds of things. I am going to be taking you through the entire process of how I have come up with my campaign for The Ghosts of Salt Marsh. Now, if you don't know what The Ghosts of Salt Marsh is, is it is an adventure supplement. It's an adventure book, actually, a massive book, 256 pages odd of adventure set in The Ghosts of the Salt Marsh. Now, I'm not going to be doing a review of that just yet. My review of the actual book will come out just after the 21st of May, which is when, by the way, the book becomes available for you to purchase. There is a lot of stuff going on in The Ghosts of Salt Marsh, so before we even start working out our campaign, we need to unpack first exactly everything that goes along with it. So that's what we're going to be doing in today's video. Next week, we're going to start with plotting out the campaign, working out where we should go, and we can only do that once we understand what is on the cards. So let's bring that up very, very quickly. What exactly are we doing? Boom! And here we go. There it is. Ghosts of Salt Marsh. This is what we're going to be working through today. We're going to be looking through what are our expectations for the Ghosts of Salt Marsh. That is not what are our expectations for the book. These are what are our expectations when we mention the words Ghosts of Salt Marsh. What does that evoke? What are we expecting to see? Because if we don't see it, if our players don't get to experience what we expect there to be, our players are going to feel very unsatisfied. We need to figure out what they want so we can give it to them and we can give it to them even more. So that is something to bear in mind. Then we need to look at what material do we have available. Just what can we draw from? What can we use? What can give us inspiration? What can drive us down that rabbit hole of creation that we as the game masters need to go on in order to create an even better campaign than before? And then we need to understand our time frame, what is and what is not doable within the time frame that we've been given. And we're looking at all the time frames, not just the time frame specific to each game session. So it's a lot of stuff we've got to get through, a lot of stuff we've got to understand in order to be able to successfully do this. So let's jump straight into that. So let's see. Expectation. What do we expect? Ghosts of Salt Marsh traditionally has this theme, this evocation of naval adventures. Adventures in the sea, high sea adventures, sailing ships, ship-to-ship -ship combat, fighting off krakens, uh, all those kinds of things. Even the cover of the book features, uh, the, the uh, normal release cover, I should say, features a group of adventurers fighting off a Sahagan in shallow waters while a ship in the distance is being attacked by a massive, dark, tentacle, tentacled creature of the unknown. We need to figure out what that is. We need to add that into our... Um, understanding. So naval adventures, right. So our players are going to expect something similar. They're going to expect that there is a ship or ships that they are involved in. They're going to perhaps want to own their own ship. Now it is Ghosts of Salt Marsh. Salt Marsh is a location. It's a city or a town, I should say, a harbour town within the Azure Sea. Now the book, the adventure book, this is a little bit of a spoiler, but the adventure book, I don't think it's not, it's not a spoiler. Everyone knows this already by now. But the city of Saltmarsh, the town of Saltmarsh, is based on the Azure Sea. Now, they have written the book specifically so that you can go, mm, no, don't have an Azure Sea in my campaign world. My campaign world is a homebrewed campaign. Saltmarsh, I'm actually going to change its name to, let's say, uh, NACL bog something like that i don't know i mean it might have a weird world like that nonetheless we're going to change the, oh, everything and you can that's how beautifully well written this book is that it fits anywhere now the idea is though that it is a coastal town it is a harbor town that leads us to our next link it is eerily coastal ghosts of salt marsh it's not 
the ships of Salt Marsh or the ocean of Salt Marsh or long walks on the beach in front of Salt Marsh. It's none of that. It is the ghosts of Salt Marsh. And so we have to bring in this eeriness, this spookiness, this unnaturalness to the whole thing. Are there ghosts in the book? Well, I'll find out after the 21st of May. But we need to create this eerie space. Fog drifts that obscure our vision. Uh, things that go bump in the night. The sea is calm and quiet except for the sound of something dying out in the middle of the harbour. All those kinds of things. We need to bring those in. Now, the very first adventure that was ever set in the sort of milieu of um, Ghosts of Salt Marsh is... Uh, this adventure, The Sinister Secrets of Salt Marsh, which was, um, I think that was the name of it anyway. Uh, the idea there is it's a sort of a dungeon crawl, if you like, and there is some nautical stuff involved, but it is very eerie. It's very scary. There's this haunted house that the characters have to go through. Now, that is going to form the basis of one of our first adventures. We've got to obviously include some of the adventures that are in the actual book itself. It does contain quite a lot of adventures. I think there's seven adventures in the book in total. So lots of exciting stuff that's going on. Now, it also inspires aquatic stuff. Now, why do I say aquatic stuff? Well, on the cover of the book is a Sahaugan. I love the Sahaugan. The Sahaugan have changed and evolved over the course of Dungeons & Dragons over decades. They used... <coughs> They used to be almost like murlocs. They used to be almost like murlocs. I mean, you've got to do the murloc sound when you say murlocs, right? Uh, they were almost like murlocs, but they were spikier and spiny. They're like stickleback murlocs, really. Very spiky, spiny kind of things with big, wide mouths originally. Then they kind of evolved and evolved, and currently they sometimes forearmed massive merman type of fish folk rather than... Uh, the the Murloc type. So they've re re they've really evolved and they've become almost like the uh, hobgoblins of the ocean. Although there is even a hobgoblin aquatic race, which I actually didn't know about, but they are there. And the name, of course, now has gone completely out of my head. You've then got all of the other aquatic races, which we very seldom see. Um, now, this is not necessarily in the actual book itself, but this is, again, what do we expect? So if you've been playing games for a long time, you go, okay, well, we expect mermen, merwomen, merfolk. We expect that to be there. We expect the aquatic aquatic elf, the um, sea elf. Now, sea elves have been around for a very, very long time and they don't often get explored. So there's this expectation that we have when we look at the Ghosts of Salt Marsh, perhaps for us to be able to play races that come from the sea, that have a nautical background rather than just the plain old orc or dwarf. Although we do also expect to understand how they are going to incorporate into something like this. Now, these are the expectations. Now, these expectations I wrote down before I even got my copy of The Ghosts of Salt Marsh. Because I'm running the game, obviously I get a preview copy beforehand. So I don't just start running it blindly. Now, before I did that, I wrote down what do I expect from Ghosts of Salt Marsh based on the hype that's been going around, based on what's been available in social media. So those are what I expect. I expect aquatic races. I expect eerie coastal adventures. I expect naval combat. I expect some kind of, of ship stuff. We've already got some of those things coming out from Dungeons & Dragons beforehand. So it's not like it's something that would be unexpectedly wild. And if you've watched interviews um, with the creators and, and company, you will, again, have these expectations that are built up. So now we've got this vast canvas. We've got quite a lot of demands from the Ghosts of Salt Marsh in terms of what kind of adventures and what kind of experiences are our players going to be going on. So there is that. Let's go into the material. What material do we have accessible to us? Well, we obviously have the Ghosts of Salt Marsh. Now that is 256 pages or 250 plus pages, let me say that, um, of amazing source material, which has been generated since the 80s. They've been pulling all sorts of adventures that have been linked to Salt Marsh over the course of the last three decades. Is it three? Eighties, nineties, noughties, and teens. Four decades. Oh my God. Okay, so over the past four decades, they've been pulling stuff together. So Ghosts of Salt Marsh is going to be a major resource for us. It is definitely going to be our principal resource. What I also like about it is that it will bring together, we hope, um, 
it does, we hope, it will bring together a lot of rule systems and sets which will basically solidify, uh, if you like, if you like, pardon the reverse simile, it will solidify water combat. It will give us an insight into how this is going to work. So that's going to give us our basis of operation. That's going to give us our base. Then we've got history. Now, when we look at history, okay, naval combat in the medieval era was not exactly, broadly speaking, very, very common. Big ships, the caravels, the barks, the early kind of large nautical ships that we think of when we think of sailing ships and ships capable of extended ocean voyages, those really only started to come out in the 14th and 15th centuries, by which time we basically had started to move away from the traditional fantasy idea. Beforehand, yes, you certainly had earlier um, types of ships, multi-masted ships. The Romans, of course, had a whole different fleet of ships available to them altogether. So history tells us that naval stuff has been around for a long time. Naval warfare has been around for a long time. And and pretty much involves two aspects, sailing on the dangerous sea and then naval combat. So we need to look to history to try and figure out just how does naval combat work within the context of a Dungeons and Dragons game. So let's look at the Romans. What did the Romans have? What did the Romans ever give us apart from naval combat and massive naval combat? The Romans had the quinquireme, that wonderful, massive, massive um, ship that basically went, well, we see your trireme and we raise you one. Literally, it was four levels, uh, five levels of oars, four levels of oars. That was the quadreme, then the quinquireme, I think it was five levels of oars with slaves busy frantically rowing away. It must have been absolutely terrifying. And their principal form of engagement was, yes, they had ballista, they had great big balls of burning oil, which they would try and fling at one another rather badly, and then they had the ram. And the ram, of course, allowed them to literally puncture into each other's ships. Generally speaking, however, that was used for military combat, where your objective was not to take your opponent's ships, it was simply to sink them, so eventually they went, hey, we surrender pirates that operated during that time and there were lots of pirates sailing around because there were ships sailing around and you had Egypt sending all that grain to Rome you had the entire Middle Eastern area the Persian Empire and what remained of the Persian Empire you had all of that sending trade goods to Rome everything was coming to Rome and going out from Rome so there was a lot of piracy that went on those ships what did they do they did something which until basically the turn of the 20th century was one of the stock standard ways of defeating your enemy. They boarded the ship with grappling hooks, gangplanks swinging over the gap of the two ships. Awfully dangerous because of the height that you require. Anyway, it doesn't matter. They did all of that kind of wonderful stuff. So that starts to give us some ideas that naval combat needs to be not only about flinging stuff over distance using ballista and catapults and scorpions and on kind, whatever kind of trajectory type of weapon you could think of trebuchet maybe but that would require a lot of a lot of ship basically trebuchets cannons you can even look at cannons dungeons and dragons has room for aquabuses and cannons they are there in the dmg under siege weapons so you can go and add whatever you like to your ship so that gives us a bit of inspiration from history. Boarding is going to be one of the big things. Now let's add Dungeons and Dragons flavor to it. You now have mages who've got long range, extends spells, you can sort of hurl a fireball 600 feet away. Um, I think that was the final calculation that someone came up with. Nonetheless, fireball, lightning bolt, uh, flaming sphere would be particularly dangerous on board these kinds of ships. So you've got that kind of element to contend with as well. Now. Oftentimes ships were designed to mitigate as much as possible the various types of things that could cause ships to stop working or set on fire, for example. When you're dealing with magical stuff, well now suddenly we start to look at, okay, so what else can we add to protect our ships from fire? 
So you start to then look to other material that's dealt with a fantasy kind of shipping environment and you go, well, charms. I would now start to add in charms or wards, uh, technically was, would be what they called, but I could very well see a very powerful enchanter or conjurer or transmuter setting up shop, and abjurer would probably be the most successful at it if I think about it, setting up shop in every single coastal town where there is a ship going... I will sell you this charm, which when you bury this into the mast of your ship, when you when you bore a hole into the mast and you put this inside of it, it protects your ship from fire. It protects your ship from lightning if you go for the advanced model. And if you buy today, I'll even throw in a charm that protects your ship from ice. Ice? But we're in the middle of the equator. There can't be ice. Ice storm. Dead. So I could have very well imagined that we would have to have some kind of organization that puts together magical charms to protect ships from certain types of things. Why can't those charms protect ships from ballista then, from physical assault? Well, perhaps the more powerful ones can. Perhaps we need to scatter them around the ship and they, become start, they start to become expensive. So you would only have charms to protect certain areas of the ship. Are ships targetable? Can we target specific locations of ships within the Ghosts of Salt Marsh? 21st of May, you'll find out. But what else can we do? Okay, so we've got magical protection. We've got fire. We've got, you know, lightning bolts and all those kinds of things. We're going to want to have territory where the mages can stand to fling that kind of magic. So instead of the usual forecastle or forecastle and aft castle, which was traditionally created because of the period in which these ships were designed, literally they were almost little towers on the front and back of the ship with crenellations um, all the way around, allowing for archers to fire out the front and fire out the back, or in this case, mages to fire out the front and the back. So there is something that we can look at. Now, if you have aquatic creatures floating around, well, let's again turn to history. And I'm sorry I'm giving you this history lesson, but this is the process that I take when I'm coming up with a campaign, and especially when there's a specific setting that we've already established our expectations. What do we look at? When we see history, what was the first submarine's weapon of choice? A corkscrew. That's what they planned on doing. They were going to sail underneath ships in the harbor, unseen by the enemy, and basically it had a corkscrew on the front, or on the top actually, and they would come up underneath the ship and Oh, your ship's got a hole in it! Oh, look at you, how silly! Your ship's got a hole! You know what happens to ships with holes in? They sink. So that's what the very first submarines were, were primarily armed with until they got a little bit more sophisticated, obviously. Um, so that's humans who can't breathe underwater naturally. What about creatures who can? Those Sahaugen that we spoke about earlier on, the merfolk that we spoke about earlier on, the aquatic elves. When you are a wooden ship floating around and you are basically just wandering through territory that you don't belong in and you have very little control over, if you are a dwarf or an elf or a human, you could have an army of merfolk on the other side of your hull and you wouldn't have a clue that they were there until they all pulled out the pegs from your ship's hull and you sank like a rock. So we need to think, how would the humans, how would those territorial um, landlubbers survive in a space where the ocean is teeming with aquatic creatures who can hold their breath indefinitely because they can breathe underwater. So that's something that we're going to look at. History doesn't provide us with any value there, just that submarines were originally corkscrewed um, in terms of their armaments. So perhaps then our aquatic creatures would realize that sinking a ship is as simple as, say, having a large corkscrew. Uh, we're being attacked by Murphy. What are they armed with? Corkscrews. Oh my God, we're so Scuppered! Uh, you know, it could be something like that. Anyway, so that's, the, again, this is just drawing from material, drawing, uh, adding it to our repository. Now, this list I then added because this uh, it, 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 it's what material can we pull from? And we can pull from films. Films, books, plays, novels, graphic, graphic novels, anime, manga, whatever. We can pull from all of that. So Pirates of the Caribbean naturally comes to mind. Why? Because, well, it's pirates, it's okay, which is not necessarily Ghosts of Salt Marsh, but it is piratical, it's naval, but it's full of magic. 
There's magic everywhere. Well, kind of. I mean, there's sort of lots of magic. I mean, there's magic around, and if you know where to go for it, there's definitely lots of magic. And there's mermaids, not very lots, and they didn't really contend with what they would actually do from an aquatic perspective, but that was because it wasn't the focus of the film. Unless there was a merman or a merwoman who was... what? Mer, mermaid. Mermaid. Sorry, why did I say merwoman? Right, mermaid. Uh, they all obviously a big service industry uh, going on down in 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 Triton's um, territory. So um, nonetheless, we've got Pirates of the Caribbean. That's four films, or four, is it four or five? I, I lost track. Anyway, that's a whole bunch of films that you can look at and you can resource and kind of unpack and say, okay, well that's what they did. That was pretty cool. That was pretty cool. That was pretty cool. The Little Mermaid. I know. I know it sounds awfully horrible, but this Little Mermaid, it. it it had a huge impact on me because growing up, Little Mermaid played out when I was a teenager and my sister was absolutely obsessed with it to the point that um, she rented out, because those were the days of VHS rental from Blockbuster, she rented out that thing so often that eventually the owner said, well, why don't you just have the VHS? It's it's bugging anyway. So you just take it and, 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 and leave it. It traumatised me tremendously for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, firstly, you know, you have Ursula, whom clearly I took on. I decided that her shape was the right shape. I just don't have all of the tentacles. Um, nonetheless, Ursula was an amazing villain because she wasn't wrong, as a matter of fact. Yes, what she did was wrong, but she got uh, uh, Ariel to sign a contract. Ariel did it of her vo own volition. At no point did Ursula Ursula cast a suggestion or a command or any kind of influence. She simply offered Ariel what she wanted and Ariel agreed to the terms of the contract. The fact that she then interfered with Ariel's plans, yes, that was a little bit wrong. But at the same time, I mean, come on, interspecies relations, that's so weird, right? Anyway, nonetheless, it would have left Eric for the rest of us. So there we go. But the point of the matter is, is that you can look at The Little Mermaid and look at how they 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 interpret undersea life and, and the bizarreness of what humans do, forks, uh, that kind of thing. And what that does is, in my mind anyway, it should have got you to think about the idea that, yes, what would an aquatic-based species, what would they need? Would they have ships? And I was thinking about this. I, I, I really was. And this is going to be a long video because I'm very excited about this whole process. So sit back and relax and, and just enjoy. What type of ship would a mermaid need? What would she need? What would a merman need in terms of a ship? Would they need ships? Sahaugen, uh, the Lokantha, what would they need? Um, all those kinds of questions, sea elves, aquatic elves, etc. And I thought, you know, we as a species take away all of our trappings and we basically become merfolk except on land so um what did we need wagons and things for transportation of heavy goods now underwater weight is a different story except that it just means that you can transport more so instead of transporting say one ton you're suddenly transporting eight tons or so give or take uh the the um salinity of the water so you can then start to appreciate that yes Quite possibly, if they started to have very large empires, and again, this is where history comes in here, where you start to have large territorial spaces, and the ocean arguably gives you that. Now, Earth's ocean, 70% of the Earth's surface is covered in water, and um, so I think it's like 60% of that is actually ocean. Um, now, the idea, or whatever it is, it's a high percent. Don't this is history, not geography. Anyway, um, the idea is is that there's a lot of water around, and so there's lots of territory. If there's lots of territory, that means there are bigger potential kingdoms than there are on land. Managing a kingdom requires communication, and communication requires transportation of said communicators. If you're traditionally using messaging and the like, yes, you can speed that up. However, let's assume that that isn't everyday, common day kind of stuff. So you can travel as far as you can swim, or you can travel as far as you can walk. Alternatively, you harness creatures that can swim faster than you. So what's the average swim speed of a merfolk? That's to be determined. What's the average speed of a dolphin? I think it's in the Monster's Manual. I'm busy looking at my books over there. I think it's in the Monster's Manual that it'll tell us how fast a dolphin can swim. I think it's 60 feet, nonetheless. <clears throat> so we start to ride dolphins, um, hippocampi, or not hippocampus, um, those are the eagle, eagle lion things. Um, what is the underwater one? It is hippo, hippocampus. Is it hippocampus? Anyway, doesn't matter. Aquatic seahorses, you, whatever it is that you have, you start to ride that. 
You then realize that you can tow along behind them creatures that have incredible amounts of constitution. Now, what I did not know is that whales have to swim continuously. Otherwise, they start to cool down. They actually need the heat that their muscles generate while swimming in order to stay alive. If you put a whale into a cage, it does not generate enough heat. It starts to cool down, especially in colder climates. So if you have a creature that is needing to be in perpetual motion, sharks as well, sharks don't like slowing down, but um, they can't inhale naturally. So um, they need water to bring oxygen to wash over their gills, that kind of thing. Oh, there's some, sorry, of course, this is not biology, okay? It's history, um, which is also not exactly correct and accurate. So just live with it. Nonetheless, whales need to swim all the damn time. That's something that we need to just accept and move on from. If that's the case, well, put a harness on that damned whale and it can transport quite happily several metric tons of whatever our commerce is from point A to point B. Now, we've got clams and things to store our jewellery in and all that kind of stuff. Do we have metallurgy? Well, that's a whole different, that's racial, cultural creation, but it is important for us to look at because this is material that we're going to have to generate if we are going to make this space believable for our players. Is this all covered in Ghosts of Salt Marsh? Well, um, we need to expand whatever is there if there is something there, and if there isn't something there, we need to have it created it in the first place, so we have to go through this exercise anyway. Aquaman, the latest, one of the latest DC films to come out. I haven't watched it yet. Um, it was on cinema very briefly here in Tokyo. Uh, so I need to watch that because it is something that is in the public awareness space. So if you have players and they have watched it and you are trying to come up with a campaign that's super spectacular, well, Aquaman had super spectacular stuff happening. And just from the trailers that I saw, there were some amazingly spectacular things. So I want to see how they have done it draw inspiration from it and go from there. If you have watched the film, then maybe there are things in it that you liked, maybe there are things that you didn't like. And perhaps it is something that is worth exploring. I certainly think that it is. So we have vast, vast quantities of resources to look at and material to unpack and understand and go, that works, N that doesn't work. We want four of those and six of those and a half a dozen of these. We then look at our time frame. So in my case, I have a specific time frame. And it is an unnatural time frame that you might not necessarily have if you're running a game online or in a, you're running an actual real game. Um, those things seem to be coming rarer and rarer, although I think that's more of a social media myth than anything else. Nonetheless, however you are running your game, you might not have these kinds of time frames. I would advocate, just by the by, that you create these time frames for yourself anyway. Because time frames cause you to have to focus, they cause you to have to think about what you're doing, and they cause you to have to understand this whole process of creating a campaign within a fixed space. And that, I think, is incredibly, incredibly beneficial. So, I have 25 days from the launch of this video. I'm recording this video on the 29th. So, I have got 27 days. Is it January, February, March, April, May? 27 days. No, wait, 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 what are we? In April. 26 days. I've got some days. 25-ish. Well, I'm not going to do any work on it today. Let's be honest. I'm recording video. So, I've got 25 days. Again, this is not temporal mechanics. Okay? This is this is salt marsh. Um, 25 days to come up with this whole campaign, this whole adventure, this whole... Uh, the, the, the plot out the whole thing. Okay, all, all fair and good and well. Your time frame, you might say to a bunch of people, hey, let's get together and play something. And they go, okay, cool. What are you going to run for us? So that gives you your own time frame. I have 25 days. So that's more than enough uh, time to, to prepare some of the stuff. Not enough time to prepare all the stuff. So I'm going to prepare what I need to prepare. And that's what you're going to find out in the videos that I will be releasing over the next three or four weeks until the show starts and then continue on until the show finishes. I have been commissioned to do 12 episodes. Dungeons and Dragons said to me, okay, we want you to do 12 episodes. Perfectly fine. Absolutely acceptable time frame. It's a completely normal time frame. It's a three month block uh, that will be happening. So perfect, works for me. 12 episodes allows me to effectively have three episodes per adventure. Now, if any of you know my system and you watch my channel, so you should, if I'm using a one-to-one -one method, that means I've basically got uh, half an adventure for the introduction, 
half an adventure for the conclusion and then two sessions basically half from one and a half from this end and then one in the middle then two sessions to actually run the bulk of the campaign of the of the adventure itself so if i've got three adventures or three slots per adventure that gives me four adventures that's great four adventures i've got five players so i can't do backstories that i cannot do unless i reduce the number of adventures which i am likely to do there's no point in running a game if it's all just about the story that the gym has come up with i can just tell you the adventure in that case we want to explore the characters that have been created so i'm not going to do four of the adventures out of the out of the seven that are in the book it's just simply too much i'm aiming to do two or maybe three. If I do two, that's six episodes. That gives me six episodes to explore the characters. One episode each, which is not bad, and then one episode in hand. That's tight, but I think that's what I'm going to aim for, is two or three of the adventures. Now, obviously, I'm going to try and weave this all together, and um, the Ghosts of Saltmarsh book presents an epic campaign. Not just Seven Adventures. I mean, the, 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 when I started to read it, I said, oh, this is brilliant, but it's going to take me a year. There's no way I can run this in less than a year. There is so much stuff going on. It's brilliant. It's absolutely wonderful. So I've got to, I've got to tr whittle it down. And I only have two-hour sessions. Now, that is important for me. If you are on a set time frame, sometimes most people go, okay, we're going to play for three hours, we're going to play for four hours. There are groups that play for longer, and I have played in sessions that have gone for day, well, two, a day, and a, it was about 18 hours. I think it's the longest I've ever played for continuously. Um, the idea is not to do that. The idea is to say, okay, well, I've got two hours to play, great. In that two-hour block, what am I going to do? How can I figure out that? So we know that I've got, an, on average, I have an hour to introduce the situation and and present the adventure to the party. They then have an hour, and that's one show done. In that second hour, they start their journey. So they're going to start to unpack where they need to go. Then I've got an entire two-hour block where they're going to have the meat of the adventure, where they're going to fight against their opponent. They're going to go on a bit of a dungeon crawl or a ship crawl, or a ship is a dungeon once you're on board the ship. So there's all that kind of stuff happening. And then in the, sec in the third episode, I've got an hour to wrap up that combat, to wrap up that environment, that situation. And in theory, then, they have an hour left to then go back to Salt Marsh or wherever it happens to be that they need to go, report back, do the shopping, do the... the oh, oh, what a great... Uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that's generally how my blocks are going to work. Chunked out like that. Is that actually what's going to happen? Mm, depends on the party. If the party is incredibly goal focused, if they're incredibly goal oriented, then yes, that is how it will play out. If they are much more social, if they're much more chatty, then I'm going to start finding myself having to figure out how to incorporate their backstories into the adventures that I'm running, and I'm only going to run maybe two adventures in totality, where it's four or five episodes her adventure. Now, this is just coming from experience uh, that I have had. You can actually watch it if you watch the Adventures of the Windswift. I can get through a standard block in about eight episodes of two hours. Yeah, that's a long one. That's a long one. That's 16 hours to, to run through an adventure. If you look at Sable Dice, the Karos Stones that I ran, I could get through an adventure in about six no, uh, yeah, about six hours, so about three sessions worth. I was I was lucky enough to be able to contain that. Sometimes I had to do it in four hours, which, again, it was achievable with that particular configuration of party. They were quite oriented in terms of, let's get this done, let's move forward, let's move forward, let's move forward. If I look at Broken World Chronicles, that sits somewhere in between. I'm sitting on about an eight-hour block per adventure, per session uh, type of thing. So I'm going to have to monitor that. I'm going to have to play it by ear, and that's only something that's going to come up once I have met my players. So all of this, all of this is sitting in my head, on the screen, on my sort of scribbled paper notes, trying to make sense of how I'm going to move forward, how I'm going to actually create this campaign. So this is my prep work. A lot of people go, well, what, what are you, pre well, how, what, how much research, how much planning do you do? This is it for now, before I start my actual adventure. And that is going to be in next week's episode, is the actual layout. So that is the one that's going to contain just all the spoilers that you could possibly, possibly hope for, because that will be the actual campaign. So that is definitely something to bear in mind. Now, 
before you go away. This is very exciting for the channel and for you because it means the giveaways are going to come up. Trust me. We have a new partner and that makes me very excited. I'm going to take this off the screen uh, so that um, it's a nice clear screen for them. So we have a new partner, a new affiliate that has joined How To Be A Great GM. So our two existing partners, as you know, are World Anvil and Dungeon Fog. World Anvil is that world aggregator, campaign manager. It's, it's just everything that you could want in terms of organizing and writing your life and creating your world and your universe. Then we have Dungeon Fog. Dungeon Fog, of course, is our map maker of choice in terms of battle maps. They make battle maps, or just beautiful, beautiful battle maps. They've even started to release some custom material just for Ghosts of Salt Marsh. That's how much of a partner they are with us as a channel. Uh, they want to really support us. So you can start to get stuff, and they're going to be releasing more stuff. So a lot of the ships, a lot of the maps are going to be built using Dungeon Fog. Our new partner, and I'm very excited to announce this, our new partner is Q Workshop. Q Workshop, you go. Q Workshop, Q Workshop. Q Workshop is the manufacturer of the manufacturer, the creator of the most beautiful dice that you can possibly imagine. Now, we've partnered with them for the next six months or so just to sort of test out the waters and see how things go. All my games are on run online, sadly. I don't have any local games, just don't have time for them, sadly. But Q, Pro, uh, Q Workshop has come in, they have got some absolutely beautiful dice. Now, they have run Kickstarters in the past with huge success to create dice that are spectacularly amazing. And they're coming out with a new range and a new Kickstarter, which I'll be talking all about next week on the 8th of May. So watch out for that. But Q Workshop, you're going to be hearing about me talking about their dice. They are sending me dice as fast as they possibly can. Uh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful dice. So Q Workshop is now part of our great family. And uh, if you are looking for dice, they are the ones to go to. They really, really are beautiful, beautiful dice. You can even make custom dice uh, on their website. So that is something that I think is quite exciting. Bear all of that in mind. Bear all of that in mind. So Ghosts of Saltmarsh, Q Workshop, some exciting things happening on How to Be a Great GM. And it's all thanks to you and to our Patreons. Our Patreons support us like you cannot possibly imagine. It is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful feeling to have these people uh, on board helping to create this this remarkable channel that uh, gives us such such long videos just on insight into how to run a campaign inside the Ghosts of Salt Marsh adventure. Nonetheless, until next week, or until the next video, or until the next live stream, you can catch us all over the place. All the information is down below. Until then, I wish you and yours the very happiest of gaming.